I want to give a big shout out to Jeff Grant and MD Melter for supporting me on Patreon. Thank you so much. My memories of this event are patchy at best, but through talking to the people involved, I put them together in a logical order. I came very close to death, and I do not recommend Detura as a recreational drug. Even though I have survived this experience, it was terrifying, but it was incredible and life-changing. I still have trouble dealing with the emotions I experience when I look back on it. This document is perhaps a therapeutic tool I am using to deal with it once and for all. Philadelphia, Thanksgiving break, junior year of high school. My best friend, and as of 2008, my wife, Amanda, slept over my house. We were big potheads at the time, but have never experimented with anything else. We woke up early to go to our friend Jeremiah's house because he grew weed, and we wanted to celebrate the break by smoking all day. I drank a beer I stole from my dad on the way there. When we got there, a strange smell filled the house. His parents were away, and he had a pot of a strange amber liquid on the stove. Jeremiah was an interesting kid. He appeared to be a run-of-the-mill street thug, but he was very interested in botany. He would see plants in people's yards and he would know their Latin name and all these facts about them. When we got there, we asked him what the stuff was. He called it Datura Loco. I had never heard of it. He said he got the seeds on the internet and planted it and made a tea from it. He told me it had similar effects to weed, which was quite false. We smoked a blunt, but I was still intrigued. We hung out for a while and decided to go to Amanda's house and watch a movie. Before we left, I asked Jeremiah for some of the Datura tea. He put about four shot glasses worth in an empty bottle and we left. On the way to Amanda's house, I drank it all. The dose was for both of us, but Amanda didn't want any, so I drank it all. It was the worst tasting thing ever, but I forced myself to drink it. We arrived at her house and sat down to watch a movie. She put on Herbie Fully Loaded. Luckily, I don't remember any of it. Sometime throughout the movie, I felt extremely thirsty. Since it was autumn, I poured myself a glass of apple cider. It was difficult to drink. Every time I took a sip, I felt like my throat was closing up. I tried to drink it, but my thirst would not be quenched. We sat a little longer, then I began feeling very uncomfortable. I had to pee, so I got up and went to the bathroom, and nothing would come out. I stayed there for about 10 minutes, but could not pee. I decided to ignore it, and I went back to the couch. After the movie, our friend Samantha came to take us to our friend Rob's house to smoke more. By the time she arrived, I was speaking mostly nonsense. I felt like I was talking normally, but neither of them could understand, so it was kind of frustrating. We got into Sam's car. On the ride, I thought I was smoking a cigarette, but I kept dropping it, and then I wouldn't be able to find it. This would continue for the next three days. We got to Rob's house and they all smoked another blunt. They didn't give me any, but I didn't notice. I was still smoking my imaginary cigarettes and speaking gibberish. I went into Rob's bathroom and tried to pee again. In my mind, I still couldn't pee, but from what I found out later, I actually peed all over the floor and the walls. I also took all of his family toothbrushes and put them in my pocket. I do not know why. They all went outside to smoke another blunt, and I did too. As they were smoking, I wandered away, and they found me about an hour later in a neighbor's yard talking to a pine tree. Again, I do not remember why. This is where my memory gets better. We left Rob's house and went to a party at my friend John's house. Again, I smoked imaginary cigarettes the whole way there. 
I had no idea who I was, where I was, or who I was with, and I had given up communicating because no one could understand me. When we got there, a lot of my friends were there, and John's mom, who I had known since kindergarten. It was his birthday, and there were balloons. The balloons moved around and seemed to follow me. Their shape shifted between squares, circles, and triangles. I continued to smoke imaginary cigarettes. At first, no one noticed my state because I was keeping quiet. I was standing in the corner because I was afraid of the balloons. John's mom saw me and came over to talk. She asked me about college and I replied. I gave her a logical answer, but to her, I was still speaking gibberish. She knew I was on something and took me to my parents, who in turn took me to the hospital. This is where it gets messy. On the walk back to my parents' house, each piece of sidewalk I stepped on seemed to shatter away. I was terrified because I didn't want to fall through, but jolts of electricity ran through me when I tried to run. My parents were panicked and rushed me to the hospital because they didn't even know I smoked weed at the time. When I got to the hospital, they took me in right away. To me, the doctors and nurses looked like monsters and I kept trying to get out of my chair and run. They had to physically restrain me. When they got a bed for me, they held me down and took my clothes off. I fought them as best as I could, but any fast movement would send a shock of electricity through my body. I punched and kicked the nurses a few times, but was unsuccessful in my attempt to escape. Eventually, they calmed me down. One of the doctors told me he was a wizard and had a magic potion to cure me. He handed me a cup of black liquid and told me to drink it. It was charcoal to pump my stomach, which was futile because it had been hours since I took it. I gulped the drink down and vomited everywhere. Fast forward a little and still no memory. Apparently at this point, my kidneys were shutting down, so they had to put a tube in my penis so that I could pee. That was not fun at all. I remember screaming a lot and trying to fight, but I was tied down. Fast forward a little more. I was now in a different room. Chewbacca was next to my bed. I was tied to the bed still, and all sorts of IVs were in me. I kept trying to rip them out, so they had to put a lot of tape on them. Again, the imaginary cigarettes came back. I smoked it for a while, then dropped it in my sheets. I tried to look for it, but instead, I found the stick shift from my car. I looked up, and I was driving down the street all of a sudden. I drove for a while, and then went to hit the brakes, but they were gone. I kicked my feet, but the sheets were covering them. I then returned to the hospital room. I looked at the small fan in the room, and a strange miniature girl was crouched behind it, staring at me. I was scared of her and told Chewbacca to take them out, and he did. I found out later that Chewbacca was my dad. Next thing I knew, I was in Amanda's dorm room, smoking a bowl like I had been a few weeks ago. All of the same people were there, and that day replayed itself almost entirely. Then, I was back in the hospital bed. This vision of the dorm room and the vision of driving my car kept happening over and over, interspersed with being in the hospital bed next to Chewbacca. The whole time I kept dropping the imaginary cigarette I was smoking. Three days later, I woke up in the hospital bed feeling like I was hit by a train. I still had the P-tube inside me and was hooked up to IVs. I had only a few memories of the past four days, but they made no sense to me. As I write this, I realize again how patchy the memory is. My parents were there and explained to me what happened. They called Amanda to find out what I took. They told me my kidneys stopped working for almost two days and just now were working again and my heart rate jumped from dangerously low to dangerously high over and over. The doctors gave me a 50% chance of survival. I spent the next day in ICU before they released me. I was extremely weak for the next five or six days and they made me go to a drug counselor. Over the next three years, I did many drugs heavily and developed some serious problems. Anytime I did acid or shrooms, I would see that small girl behind the fan, and it creeped the hell out of me. 
Eight months ago, I went to jail and then to rehab, and I have not used drugs since then. Detura was the first step in a long road of drug abuse, and looking back, I wish it scared me straight. I still wish I remember more of what happened, but maybe it's best that I don't. March 17, 2000 It was around 5 in the evening when I decided to collect a fresh specimen of plant material to begin with. I just went out of my house to the nearest playground, which is 3 minutes away, and just as I turned the corner, I saw three fine specimens of Datura anoxia. The plants were a deep green, growing to about 3 feet in height. There were numerous flowers and seed pods. Invoking a silent prayer, I cut off two leaves and what seemed to me to be a tender seed pod, not completely matured. I took these home. I skinned the seed pod using a peeler. I cut this peeled datura pod in half. Half went into the compost pit and the other half went into my stomach with the two leaves. Ingestion was a grueling process and I almost threw up twice before I can get the plant material down my throat. I used some water to get it down. The taste was extremely bitter. I retired into my room and played some music, John McLaughlin with Shakti, I think. The first effects of the trip were obvious within approximately 20 minutes. I felt a dull, throbbing pain in my stomach. Not surprising considering that I had fasted for 12 hours prior to ingestion. It also felt like I had a rise in body temperature. The feeling rapidly changed into a flu-like feeling. This was getting me worried, and I was only an hour into the trip. I thought a change of scenery would be ideal, so a friend of mine, who was trip-sitting me, said we would go for a ride. I wasn't too sure of my physical coordination because I was feeling pretty nauseous, but my sitter assured me that there was no obvious physical response. He didn't seem to find me off balance at all. The elevator was really something, and I felt my stomach move into my throat. I would have thrown up had it not been that we reached the ground floor. As I sat on my bike, I noticed a distinct change in my mood, a change that I just cannot describe in words. It was like an upliftment of my physical body, a lightness. The entire environment was beginning to get a little dreamy edge to it. I said to the sitter, is this the beginning of the trip? It has to be. And he looked back at me and smiled. I felt compelled from deep inside to laugh, but my lips, they refused to move, for an instant wave of nausea racked my insides, and then it subsided again. It did not affect me during the next three days at all. Things were definitely starting to get weird now. There was a distinct change in my visual field, a blurring of things. It was like the whole environment around me was smeared as soon as I attempted to change my field of view. Gradually, all inputs from the peripheral vision area were gone. It was like looking at a painting. Move my head, smear, then painting again, and so on and so forth. This went on for quite a long period of time, during which my sitter also said that I was continuously talking to myself. The sitter mentions that I distinctly talked about time and that there was no such thing. It seemed I was way off from my usual rants. He said I was looking into space and blabbering about how time is always warped and that there is no such thing as time. This went on till almost one in the morning when the sitter reports that I started to get agitated about something. The sitter thought it was a good idea for me to have a shower. I have no memory of it at all, though I have distinct memories of what followed. It almost felt like my body was coming back together. This was just as I was getting out of the bathroom. I felt cold and weary. My sitter reports that my pupils are completely dilated and there is some amount of redness in the eyes. All lights around look really bright, so I put on a night lamp, lie down, and decide to read. The book makes absolutely no sense. The text looks like a barcode or the UPC. When asked what book I am reading, I have no clue. I have absolutely no idea what book I am holding. I have no visual focus. At this point, I tell the sitter that I am not feeling well and that I should see a doctor. My sitter reminds me that I have ingested some datura. I don't seem to have a memory that I took any. 
I spent half an hour trying to convince my sitter that I didn't take any Datura and that he must be crazy, saying, I would never do Datura, man. I think shrooms are the best. Writing this down, I can imagine what other people who have tripped on Datura go through. There doesn't seem to be a distinct difference in tripping and not tripping. You feel completely normal, yet you are in serious delirium and blabbering about all sorts of things. All of a sudden, I feel the need to lay down. The sitter turns off the light, and I begin to fly. I had this feeling of enormous speed, like when you are skydiving or bungee jumping. It felt like my heart was going to thump out of my rib cage. My skin was crackling with electricity, and then I saw my mother. At that moment, the feeling stopped. I asked my mom what she was doing here. She should be teaching. The spring term is about to begin. She just laughed at me and asked what I wanted and why I had come. At that point, I got really confused. I told her she was the one who had to come to me. I thought she wanted to meet me. She said to me, no, I don't want to meet you. And then I got the feeling again. I feel really sweaty and damp. It's like the air all around me has become really humid. I feel someone's hand on my shoulder. I look up, a blurry outline of my sitter. He said that for the past three hours I have been curled up in a fetal position on my bed, just shivering with cold. He felt a distinct rise in my body temperature and decided it was time for a shower. When on Datura, showers bring back a distinct back to normal feel, regardless of the fact that you are in extreme delirium. This can make you do really stupid things. March 18th, 2000 My sitter is prompting me to eat something. He said it's been almost 20 hours since I have been tripping. I tell him I'm not feeling hungry. I ask why is the light so bright, and he says it's daytime, the sun is out. I asked him when will I rise, and when will I set, the light hurts my eyes. I am complaining continuously, almost whining. He gets me some bread and some milk. Suddenly I say I am hungry, and wolf down four slices of bread and swallow the milk. It's strange, because normally I hate milk. I have puked all over the table and have shit in my pants. My sitter has changed, and I have no clue who or where I am. There is darkness everywhere I look. I felt no nausea, but I still puked, almost like a purge. At this point, I say out loud, R, you think I'm dead? Because I think so. And I'm not feeling so great. Can we call a doctor? Again, my sitter from now on, R, reminds me that I'm tripping on Datura. I say, so what if I'm tripping on it? I think I'm dead anyway. R laughs a bit and says, it's been 34 hours since you ate it and you are still very delirious. I seem to find it funny and laugh too. When he gives me a hand mirror, I can't see a thing and say it isn't a mirror, just a dumb piece of plastic. He says it's my girlfriend's compact she had left behind, but I say I don't have a girlfriend. I don't remember any of what follows, so it's a rough reconstruction. March 19th, 2000 I curled up in my bed and was talking to myself for hours. I urinated in my bed two times, and I lacked any sense of place and time. R reports that my body became flushed, where the skin gets all red like when you blush. Seems towards the end of day two, I was no longer agitated. I wanted to read a book, but I still couldn't. I keep complaining about my inability to read. R says he'll put on some music. He plays something on the CD player, and I can't hear a thing. He says it's the doors, and I say it sounds like he is playing some kind of sound frequency. I talk animatedly about how I can fly when I close my eyes. R tells me, why don't you relax and try to fly? It seems after this that I went to lay down on my bed for almost 10 hours. It seems I was blabbering in the beginning, but gradually I stopped, and then at some point during the day, I fell asleep. March 20th, 2000 I wake up at around 6 a.m. I feel cleansed, I can read and write, and listen to music. I feel like I have that heavy-headedness you get when you smoke through the night and sleep very little. R says he has never seen someone trip on Datura like that, and that he would never like to try it. He says I have been completely mad for the past two and a half days. I don't agree with him, but I keep my mouth shut. 
March 21st, 2000. I have slept for almost 20 hours, had very vivid dreams, woke up thrice to drink water. I feel like I have been reborn. I feel perfectly normal. Datura has to be, without doubt, the weirdest deliriant there is. It had me completely deluded about what I saw, what I heard, what I ate, and what I felt. It is a complete acting drug, one that should be used only if you are ready to walk the fine line. Datura is really taking it close to the edge. Never have I felt elation, depression, anger, hate, love, and insanity all in one trip. Never have I felt such emotive physical fear and sadness, and I didn't know I could fly. I do not recommend Datura for anyone who is not ready. Just open your mind. At around midnight, I took 20 Dramamine tabs and 2.5 grams of Datura. Big mistake with the Datura. After only about 30 minutes, I started to feel like how I do when the flu starts out, not like a trip at all. Eventually, how long this went on, I cannot remember. I lost all contact with reality and thought more or less that I had died. In all reality, from what my mother has told me, I removed all of my clothing ran through the house naked, and screamed about the leaves and the tree branches growing out of my grandmother's head. Then I went into the bathroom and took everything out of the cabinet and arranged it on the floor. After that, my mom said she didn't know where I ran off to. Well, I'm guessing I blacked out, because all I remember now and could remember then was that I thought I died and somehow managed to wake up in my bed. When I woke up, I felt very heavy and tired still and my chest hurt. I realized I had been sweating badly because everything was soaked with sweat. I got up to go to the bathroom and immediately fell down with extreme chest pains. After about five minutes of this, I started to black out again. The next thing I knew, I was waking up in the intensive care unit of the hospital here. They told me I had suffered a massive heart attack from atropine-like poisoning and that I was extremely lucky to even be alive at all. After a few days and many, many tests, it came to be known that I'd suffered a mild heart attack while on the chemicals. Then the next morning, from all the stress and residual effects from the drugs, I suffered the major one. I'm only 24 years old and have to take medication the rest of my life to keep my heart beating normal and to keep it from not racing out of control. The Dramamine and Datura combo caused damage to the AV nodes and the natural pacemaker in my heart by causing far too much stimulation, which in turn caused me to have a heart attack, damaging my heart completely. The doctors tell me as long as I take the medications and don't do this ever again, I should live a normal, healthy life. But I still suffer chest pains and high blood pressure now, which I truly believe to be caused from that experience. I have done both chemicals separate and had some wild and fully whacked out experiences from it, to which I hope I never experience again.